Good afternoon. Today marks the fifth day since the Saudi-led coalition has imposed a complete blockade on Yemen. Since Sunday, the coalition has not facilitated any humanitarian movements into or out of Yemen, carrying relief items and aid workers. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us they've heard of health facilities shutting down because they cannot cover the increased fuel costs, and water pumping stations have also been impacted. Yesterday afternoon, the Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, briefed the Security Council in, consultation, in close consultations on the issue of the humanitarian situation in Yemen. Speaking to reporters afterwards, he condemned what he had called the outrageous missile attack on Riyadh over the weekend. Mr. Uh, Lowcock cautioned that a poten the potential famine in Yemen would be the largest the world has ever seen in decades, with millions of potential victims. To avert such a famine, he said the recent measures introduced by the coalition, mainly the closing of air, sea, and land access to Yemen, must be lifted and that the following five steps must be taken. The immediate resumption of regular UN and other humanitarian partners' air service to Sana and Aden, a clear and immediate assurance that there will be no further disruption of these air services, an immediate agreement on the uh, pre-positioning of the World Food Program vessel in the waters off Aden and assurances there will be no further disruption to the function that it supports. The immediate resumption of humanitarian and commercial access to all seaports of Yemen, especially for food, fuel, medicine, and other essential supplies. And lastly, the scaling back of interference with, delays to, and blockages of all vessels that have passed the inspection by the UN verification and inspection mechanism so they can proceed to port as rapidly as possible. And in a joint statement issued yesterday, the humanitarian community in Yemen also expressed its great alarm at the coalition's decision to close all Yemeni airports, seaports, and land crossing. They reiterated that humanitarian aid is not the solution to Yemen's humanitarian catastrophe with only a peace process able to halt the horrendous suffering of millions of innocent civilians. Turning to Syria, Jan Eglin, the special advisor to the Special Envoy for Syria, spoke to reporters in Geneva following the latest meeting of the Humanitarian Task Force. He said that he felt we are now returning to some of the bleakest days of the conflict, with reports of attacks against civilians and displacement of civilians ranging from Idlib to Aleppo and the northwest through Raqqa and Deir ez-Zor in the north and northeast and in areas like Damascus and Hama. Mr. Eglin said that the worst situation in this is in eastern Ghouta, just near Damascus, where 400,000 civilians are suffering in a dozen besieged towns and villages. He said the UN convoys are the only lifeline, but those convoys were blocked again over the past week, despite the best efforts by the humanitarian community to get them in. Mr. Eglin's remarks are available online. And turning to Myanmar, uh, our humanitarian colleagues there tell us that access uh, in Myanmar's northern Rakhine state remains extremely challenging, with the UN being granted almost no access by the government. The Red Cross movement continues to provide assistance in the area, having reached tens of thousands of people with food and other services already. However, the needs remain high, with the Red Cross movement aiming to reach more than 180,000 people with assistance by the end of the year. Further humanitarian access and assistance is urgently needed. The Secretary General has called for, an, for full and unfettered access for aid workers in Myanmar, including in Rakhine State, and we continue to encourage the government to implement this call to ensure that all those in need receive assistance. As a result, the overall limitations on access, the UN has not been able to conduct an independent comprehensive needs assessment in northern Rakhine. And our colleagues at the UN Verification Mission in Colombia issued a press release with the Episcopal Conference of Colombia, highlighting the first month of monitoring of the ceasefire between the government of Colombia and the National Liberation Army. At the regional local level, the UN mission has established 33 verification centers which are now operational. In several regions of Colombia, the humanitarian situation of the population has been positively impacted by the suspension of armed confrontation. In others, serious challenges remain, such as the violence in Tumaco in October, in which several peasants were killed, and the murder of the governor and indigenous leader, Aulio Isarama Forastero.
The UN mission and the Episcopal Conference call upon the parties to undertake all possible efforts to avoid incidents that put communities at risk and to maintain their commitments to the work of the monitoring and verification mechanism. And at uh, the UN Climate Conference going on in Bonn, uh, we are told that negotiations continue at a working level and more difficult issues will be tackled when ministers meet next week. Starting tomorrow, the conference will look at the uh, progress on climate action by themes, beginning at the look of energy, water, and agriculture. And on the margins of the conference, the UN Environment Program released a report stressing that the more progress is needed towards assessing climate adaptation policies around the world. The Adaptation Gap Report looks at ways in which countries measure their progress on adaptation and resilience and explores options on how to translate this into globally comparable metrics that are needed to track progress towards the Paris Agreement and uh, the Paris Agreement goal on adaptation. The report is online. And a quick uh, update from the FAO. They tell us that while food commodity prices have been generally stable, the cost of importing food is set to rise in 2017 by 6% from the previous year, and that's according to their outlook, which was published today. The higher import bill, the second highest tally on record, comes at a time where inventories are robust, harvest forecasts are strong, and food commodity markets remain well supplied. But it's particular of concern to least developed countries and countries classified by the FAO as low-income food deficit countries. More information online. A um, couple of uh, notes going forward. After I brief, after we're done here, Brendan uh, will brief you on behalf of the PGA, and then I will be joined by Najat Roshdi, the Deputy Special Representative for the UN Peacekeeping Mission in the Central African Republic. She will brief you on the humanitarian situation there, as she is the humanitarian coordinator for the mission. Um, later this afternoon, the Secretary General is uh, will be back from the Chief Executive Board's retreat, and at 2 p.m. we expect him to speak at an informal meeting of the GA on his reform proposals on the peace and security uh, pillar. Uh, there's a document out on that if you want more information. And tomorrow morning uh, at 8.45 in the morning, the Secretary General will be uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question or the comment. Uh, we'll be uh, 8.45, the Secretary General will do a brief, uh, we'll do a press, press stakeout outside the Security Council on upcoming travel and other issues. Uh, and today we thank our friends in Belarus and Morocco for their payments in full, bringing us up to 142 fully paid member states. Question time, Madame. Um, on Yemen. Um, so the Secretary General talked to uh, Mr. Al Jubair, the um, uh, Saudi uh, Foreign Minister. Um, can you confirm that uh, he got? Uh, uh, he was promised that he will um, that the blockade will be um, uh, uh, lifted in very soon, or could you say more on no, this? No, I, I can't. Say he did speak. Uh, I cannot tell you more. What I. I we can only speak for the now. Uh, and now the humanitarian aid is not coming in, either by land, by sea, or by road. And as we've said, uh, the, the, the possible ramifications are almost too tragic to, uh, to think about. Uh, we're already seeing uh, some impact on, on the closures. And no doubt, as, as every day passes by, we'll see more and more impact. A follow up. I mean, the Saudi-led uh, coalition blockade is possible only with the help also of other countries. Why is the Secretary General is not more um, clear or uh, criticizing member states who are delivering uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia? Uh, and it has been like records high. The, the weapons sale from England, America, and other countries to the Saudis. There are there, Security there is, Council is, members. Right, no, I, I, I fully understand the, the thrust of your question. I think the Secretary General has been clear that all those who have a uh, influence on the parties need to bring that influence to bear in order for the blockade to be lifted. Uh, he is not um, saying more about that. I mean, he is. He keeps saying that they should have more, say something and put more pressure. But that's all what we hear from him. And he's I think it, I think the message is pretty clear. Uh, Carol and then Sato. 
ask if the Secretary General was satisfied with the statement or the, the press elements from the Security Council yesterday on Yemen. I think we will be satisfied when uh, the, the, we see the blockade being lifted. Sato. Uh, the humanitarian situation is very dire in Yemen, as you put it. And yesterday, the uh, Security Council uh, announced a press uh, element. So uh, could you elaborate a little bit about uh, UN diplomacy toward the Saudi Arabia coalition and the Yemen government? Uh, is working on or um, uh, especially after yesterday's Security Council? There have been contacts at many levels uh, over the last 72 hours uh, in order to get, uh, to get this blockade lifted. Uh, our efforts, our phone calls have clearly not done the trick uh, as the blockade continues uh, at this time. Mr. Lee. Sure. On, the, on this Yemen call, while it was good that, that uh, Under Secretary General Lokok mentioned the call, why didn't you, like, I, didn't you provide sort of a, a list such calls or a readout of such calls? I know this was done in the past, and mm -hmm. it's not like if it's not working, not having them be secret calls, maybe a regular reading out. Can you explain why you don't read out calls anymore? I think some, some calls we give readouts of and others we don't. The meeting with Mac, for example, with the president of Argentina, they gave an extensive mm -hmm. readout afterwards. Mm -hmm. Was it accurate? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not able okay. to, to speak to that. I want to ask you about on Burundi. The, the, as, as I'm sure you've seen, the ICC judges have voted to open an inquiry into events between 2015 and 17 until recently. I know, it, one, I mean, I guess given that the, the, you, the, the Secretary General has an envoy and is involved in it, do you have any comment on it? And I'd sort of expect you to actually to read it out. I've seen you before, in, in the past, although the ICC is a separate entity, you know, say. The, the, well, as, as you say, the ICC is a separate uh, entity. What is important for us is that we welcome any steps that will bring some accountability uh, for the crimes done against, uh, against civilians. Has, he, has the Secretary General, Mr. Cofando, seen the statements by the, the I don't know which near Metway it was, but they're calling this the last, last dance for the, for the West and, and uh, really denouncing the, the, uh, the decision to open an investigation? Well, is I mean, it helpful? Uh, it's, uh, the decision was the I, was the ICC's, and I said we and as I said, we welcome any steps that would help us bring us closer to accountability. Go ahead. Sure, I wanted to ask you. I'm sure you've also seen this BBC story about um, the mission in CAR. Maybe you know. I don't know if, if um, the next speaker will be able to address it, but it seems that in 2015 there were were some some UPC rebels that actually attacked and injured a UN peacekeeper, which is often said to be a war crime, that were released without any punishment at all back to the rebel group. And, and how does this, does the Secretary General believe that such a move would in fact put other peacekeepers at risk because we're, it's no we're longer? Asked, uh, we are looking into the basis of the story. Mr. Bayes. There are persistent claims that Saudi Arabia is either detaining or restricting the actions of the leaders of two other member states, mm -hmm. President Hadi of Yemen and Prime Minister Hariri of Lebanon. They are only claims. What is the UN doing to try and find out what the status is of those two leaders? We have no way of independently verifying uh, the status or whereabouts of uh, these two. Uh, one, one is a head of state uh, and the other one head of government. Uh, so we have no, no way of independently verifying these accounts one way or another. Evelyn. Condemned, and rightfully so, has been used uh, against the missile that was fired from Yemen to Saudi Arabia. But we haven't heard the word condemned when it comes to Saudi Arabia's actions of cutting off the vital supplies, the well, access. I, I, and, I think uh, we've, used, we've used a lot of words, catastrophe, we've called it for it to stop. So I'm, I'm not, um, uh, I think we've been pretty clear and determined uh, in our stand against uh, against what is what is currently well, happening, is what is currently happening uh, to the Yemeni people. Well, nobody yes, can be for it. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Uh, anything about uh, meeting between Secretary General and the Turkish Prime Minister? It was done at the request of the Turkish Prime Minister. If we have something afterwards, I will uh, I will let you will know. Will there be a readout about it? I will let you. We'll see. After. And I have yeah, another question about uh, Iraq. Uh, as you know, the crisis is still continues between uh, the 
the the Kurds mm -hmm. and the Iraqi government. Um, is the Secretary General uh, planning to make a statement or anything about it since the beginning of the crisis? I mean, I think we've spoken uh, we about it from, from here. Uh, I'm about Mr. Secretary General Mr. Uh, Mr. Kubish has been obviously following it. And as we've said, we have, uh, we have a standing offer to help uh, facilitate the dialogue between uh, the federal government and the regional government in Kurdistan. Yep. Um, Area formula meeting on Venezuela that the council is planning. Uh, do you expect anyone from the secretariat to brief? I'm or? not aware. I will try to find out. I'm not aware. Yaman, and sorry, and then Sato. The authority have uh, issued international arrest warrant uh, for 15 uh, leaders of the Anglophone Separatist Party. Any reaction from the UN? Uh, not, not at this time. Not more than what I said yesterday. Sato. Uh, thank you, Stefan. My question is about Human Rights Council in Geneva. Uh, recently, uh, Nikki Haley uh, made a speech. Uh, U.S. will uh, withdraw from the Human Rights Council if the so-called blacklist is uh, made published. Uh, do you have any comment on the, the U.S. Uh, Nikki Haley's uh, No, uh, I think that would be best addressed to the High Commissioner's Office. Do you um, do you condemn the uh, do you condemn the um, blockade that uh, on uh, Yemen by the Saudi-led coalition? Of course. I mean, if you look at all the words that have been used, yes, Mr. Lee. Sure. I guess just one follow-up on Herman's question. question. I think what you said yesterday is that you were unaware of these arrest warrants. So, have there been, have there been any steps taken to? I've become As aware I said, of I have nothing else to, to add. Okay. I wanted to ask you about, uh, I've asked you in the past about um, dollar a year, uh, uh, UN officials, but this uh -huh. is something I had never seen it. In the blue book, there's the, <clears throat> the listing as a, as a UN assistant secretary general of a Mohammed Biavoji of Guinea. He's called Unique Assistant Secretary General, Africa Risk Capacity, Johannesburg. And when you... Which blue book? The, you know, the protocol book, the book, okay. the, there's a list of UN officials and there's, a, there's USGs and ASGs at uh, headquarters I will, I've never and heard in of the field. Person. I've never heard of him either, but he's doesn't, listed it. Ne because neither of us have heard of him doesn't mean he doesn't exist. But the so Africa let's, Risk let's, Capacity is an AU body. So I just, maybe there's some agreement that he would, could become a UN ASG. I, I, I will, and, and I will the, Okay, all right. And the other one is maybe you'll, there's an audit, there's an OIOS audit that Inner City Press has published of the pension fund, and it, it's pretty critical mm -hmm. of its deals with, uh, with a, uh, an unnamed uh, accountancy firm, which I believe to be PCW. Mm -hmm. And it says that, that you know, only 25% of the work that was done was actually mm -hmm. bid out, mm -hmm. and the rest of it was done yeah. by people at $475 yeah. an hour. But the thing that really jumped out at me is there were $1.8 million of spending that was entirely unaccounted for, not, not approved. The, although it was paid out, it was not pursuant to any contract. So I'm wondering, I know that there's a decision coming up for the Secretary General as to the, the pension, the CEO, he's gotten com communications from, from the board, from the staff unions. Is he aware of this, this $1.8 million issue? I, I don't know if he's particularly aware of, uh, of the audit. I wasn't aware of the audit, but doesn't mean, clearly doesn't mean he wasn't aware. Uh, and obviously the decisions of the hiring, uh, when decisions of hiring come, everything will be taken into consideration. I will go get our guest. Uh, no, first, uh, Brendan, sorry, yes. Hide. Um, do you have any comment on the foreign policy report today um, alleging that the Deputy Secretary General was involved in a timber smuggling operation between Nigeria yes, and China? Yes, uh, and I will say the following. First of all, just to be clear that the Secretary General is, was informed by the Deputy Secretary General about the reports, and he reiterates his full support and confidence in her. She, the Deputy Secretary General, Mina Mohammed, of course, categorically rejects any allegations of fraud. The Deputy Secretary General welcomes the effort to shine more light onto the issue of illegal rosewood logging and exportation that she fought hard to address during her tenure in the Nigerian government. In, uh, she says that her actions as Nigerian environment minister were intended to deal with the serious issue of illegal wood, wood exportation. As a result, she instituted a ban and set up a high-level panel to find policy solutions to the crisis of deforestation in Nigeria.
Ms. Mohammed says the legal signing of export permits for Rosewood was delayed due to her insistence that stringent due process was followed. She said she signed the export certificates requested before the ban only after due process was followed and better security watermark certificates became available. Thank you. Very quick, yes, go ahead. I, just, I was interested in this. Obviously, it, it's, a, it's a very detailed uh, report in foreign policy, and as, as you know, or you or Fairhan had said, she just recently re uh, received the <sighs> Diplomat of the Year Award from Foreign Policy right. down in D.C. Yeah. Is there any, was she aware of this story <laughs> in being in preparation when she accepted the award? Was the award, how long was the sort of, often to receive the award, you have to be present? How long was well, the I mean, I think discussions? some of those questions uh, should be addressed to foreign policy. She was fully aware uh, that the story was going to come out uh, when she received the award. Thank you.